how hydrogen bonding becomes more important as you get smaller and smaller in scale. And the analogy of a fly pushing through a spider web versus us is one that I like you guys to use. What that means physically is that viscosity goes up as you get smaller and smaller and that inertia decreases as you get smaller and smaller. And there's two types of viscosity. There's a dynamic viscosity, which is an intrinsic property of the fluid itself. So different fluids have different viscosities. Honey, tar have higher viscosities than water do at, all, at any particular scale that you pick. But then there's this viscosity that we're talking about in the Reynolds number that is fun a function of scale. So viscosity in the water changes drastically as you get smaller and smaller. It increases very much as you get smaller and smaller. So these are the, these are the equations for the Reynolds number. Um, I generally don't ask students to memorize these equations, but I do think they help you understand the relationships between scale, velocity, density of objects, this in the dynamic viscosity of the water and the surface area and length of the object as it moves through the water or the water moves past it. So these are very useful relationships whether you're thinking about uh, swimming fish, designing a boat or an airplane, essentially anything that's moving through a fluid or has a fluid moving past it. So the first point is this viscosity. And you can think of this as the water's resistance to moving, essentially. And it is a function of the dynamic viscosity, which I just talked about. The greater the viscosity of the fluid, the more viscous something feels. So if you're trying to swim in a pool of honey, it's going to be more difficult than if you're trying to swim in a pool of water, right? The next one is surface area. If you have a, a, a bigger surface area, the apparent viscosity is greater. So think about driving down the highway. And you stick your hand out the window. Well, you're not driving, you're a passenger. So you gotta be safe. You stick your hand out the window, and you have it this way, right? So the surface area that the wind's going against is like this. I mean, you can feel the wind a little bit. But if you turn your hand like that, right, you really increases the viscosity because the frontal surface area has changed this and it feels more viscous to you. Right? Then you go like this and the Bernoulli effect makes lift and your hand goes up and down. Um, but So surface area increases viscosity. The velocity increases viscosity. So that's either the velocity of the organism or the water moving past the organism. Think about wading in a stream. If you wade upstream, it feels very viscous to you, right? It feels like it's thick. If you wade downstream, it feels like it's, it's easy to move, right? It's, it's not viscous at all. So the faster the fluid moves that you're in, the more viscous it seems relative to the body. And the last one is characteristic length. So all of these things increase viscosity. The longer the object is, that decreases the viscosity. So you can think of why it is we have um, javelins that are shaped the way they are, right? They have a low frontal surface area, and they have a long body. So they have very little viscosity, and they move through the air very well. You think of why a fish that swims very fast is shaped the way it is, right? Again, if you look at a fish that swims quickly, um, uh, salmon or something from the front, it's got it, you don't see much, you know, you see about this much of a fish. But if you take, turn it to the side, you've got a long object. The reason for that is as you move down the object, the fluid interacts less and less with it as you move down the object. So you can move a lot of mass through the water with a small surface area. So characteristic length is important. Essentially that's why Airplanes are shaped the way they are, why dragonflies are shaped the way they are, why birds are shaped the way they are, why fish are shaped the way they are. And this is very important, this characteristic length. One of the things that happens when you get this, this term, 
when you get very small spatial scales here, your viscosity goes way up. And your characteristic length, the surface area, doesn't matter much anymore. So you lose the need to basically streamline an organism. We'll talk a bit more about that as we move through this. The second point is inertia. So inertia is in part a function of the density of the object. I have two things here. I have a water balloon and I have a bowling ball, right? And I'm gonna throw the water balloon or the bowling ball at you. Which would you want me to throw at you? Water balloon, right? Why? Because if the water has less density than a bowling ball and so when it hits you, it's gonna hurt you less. So that's the density of the object moving really through. Greater the density, the more, more inertia it has. Surface area, the bigger the object is, essentially, the more inertia it, it has. And then inertia goes up as the square of the velocity. So this means bacteria, I talked about this last time, bacteria have very small amount of inertia. When a bacteria with a flagella stops, it coasts an angstrom. When a fish stops, it coasts 20 body length or something like that. And the faster something goes, obviously, you know, if I'm going to throw a fastball at Adam at 100 miles per hour, that's going to hurt a lot worse than at 50 miles per hour. Right? I'm not going to, but because I can't throw 100 miles per hour. Okay. okay, so all these things go together, and if you put them all together, you get this Reynolds number. And it's a nifty number because it's a unitless number. And it, but it allows you to essentially create equivalences of flow and understand how the properties of water vary with scale. So one of the things we're going to do in the lab is we're going to do some experiments where we take corn syrup and we push things through it or we let things flow by it. And essentially what we're doing is, and if we put a marble falling through corn syrup, it's like a bacterium falling through water. Because what we've done is artificially increased this dynamic viscosity to offset the fact that we also increased our scale. So that's why people that, so people play um, these games when they do airplane design, for example. And rather than build a 747, they'll build a little model of that, but they'll increase velocity, right, relative to really, really fast wind, so it appears that it's about acting as the same as so that you, this, this is a unitless effort. So small organisms and slowly flowing water and small spatial scales have a small Reynolds number, right? <coughs> Big organisms here, large characteristic length. Big organisms, faster fluid, has a larger Reynolds number. So we'll go through some examples of this and why this is ecologically relevant. One of these is this dynamic viscosity. That is the intrinsic property of water of viscosity it changes drastically with temperature. So water near the freezing point here is on the temperature on the x-axis and on the y-axis we have this semi-poise, which is just a uh, unit of viscosity. We have maybe 1.75 units in when we're in the winter time and the water's near freezing, right? When we come up here to 25 degrees, we're at about 0.75, almost half of the viscosity of the water. Is the, this, is the, this is the property of water that's the intrinsic property of the fluid. It's independent of scale. It's like tar versus water. Only it's in water, you get more and more viscous as you get more cold. This is part of the reason that fish are so inactive in the winter, because it costs them so much to swim through the water. It's going to cost them more per unit energy they get bring in in their food to physically get themselves from point A to point B. So not only is their metabolism lower, but it costs them more to get around. Likewise, any filter feeding organism, such as a zooplankton, or even a protozoa that's eating bacteria, has to deal with this increased viscosity. And it will make it more difficult at colder temperatures for them to filter or get their prey out of 
the solution than at warmer temperatures. Right, so it has direct ecological <laughs> relevance. So I said that different organisms experience different Reynolds numbers. And so the Reynolds number here is here on the y-axis, and you can see it goes 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, over 10 orders of magnitude. And these are the ranges of scales that organisms tend to operate at. Okay, so we're going to see this idea of scale pop up again and again in this class. It's important to know what scale you're at. It has ecological relevance. It has biological relevance. So the bacterium, the smallest organisms, run down here at about a micron, 10 to the minus 6 diameter, uh, meters diameter, and can go very, fairly slow. It has very low Reynolds number. What that means is that essentially the solution is so viscous and its ability to streamline is absolutely unnecessary. And we'll get to that in a second. And, we, and so if you, when we look at the algae and the bacteria and even the zooplankton, you'll see they look kind of chunky. Right? They're just not streamlined. They have all kinds of weird shapes. You start getting up into mayfly larvae, dragonfly larvae, and fish, then all of a sudden they're big enough that this streamlining has to make some effect. Okay, so they're, they're having widely different velocities that they're operating in, widely different sizes, and changes their Reynolds number. So, Okay, so this comes into a bunch of contrasts. Probably, you know, oftentimes what I'll do is I'll throw up a table like this and I'll put one or two things in there and then you'll have to fill out the rest of the rest of the things. Or I can flip it around. You'll see in the old test, but this is this is different. So we have small Reynolds number versus high Reynolds number, small organisms versus large organisms, and there tends to be a break point. We'll talk about this in a minute. It's related to flow and diffusion. You have high viscosity when they're small, low viscosity when they're large. Low inertia when they're small, high inertia when they're large. Flow, this is the next topic. We'll get to it. Exactly why they get streamlined, and we'll talk about that. This also relates to diffusion, how chemical materials move in and out of organisms' bodies. How things get to organisms in their environment. We'll talk about that. And then the next topic will be sinking rates. We'll talk about Stokes' law. And because many lake organisms need to stay in the water column, it's important. And the relative energy required for motility. We've already talked about that because the viscosity um, it gets greater as you get smaller. So so we'll talk about diffusion and movement of water, movement of materials in water, and movement of stuff through water. And there's some very important concepts here that we're going to have to cover. Turbulent flow versus laminar flow versus molecular diffusion. And important concepts uh, include uh, flow boundary layer and streamline. So the first idea here is the flow boundary layer. So if we have a fluid flowing across a solid surface from your left to your right, and you put some particles in it that you can trace the movement of the, of the water parcels as they move past, what will happen as you get closer and closer to the surface is that the water velocity will fall off. So very close to the surface, actually there's a layer of water that doesn't move at all. This is called the no-slip zone. This is actually why we can walk on a wet floor, because there, we're not going to get all the water molecules out between us and the floor, right? But if they could slip easily, we wouldn't be able to get any traction whatsoever. What's happening is those hydrogen bonds of the water are interacting with the solid surface and the bottom of our shoe and each other and allowing us to transmit that force at that very few molecules thick that are left between us when we're walking on the floor. This leads to this area where there's no movement of water whatsoever, very close to the surface. This may be 100 microns or so thick, you know, a tenth of a millimeter or less. Then as we move up into the fluid, there's what we call laminar flow. That is, the viscosities 
not so high that the fluid can't move, but it's high enough that it won't mix other than in the direction of the flow. Okay, so the flow line streams are straight. At some point, you move far enough away from the surface that you get this turbulent mixing, right? So this is, defines what we call the flow boundary layer. Another way of looking at it is that layer in which the effect of the surface is transmitted into the flow of the surface, flow of the water across the surface. And if you get far enough away from that surface, the hydrogen bonds aren't interacting essentially with each other enough to have any effect on the surface and the water can just mix. So in your average, in the Kansas River, do you think most of the flow in the open channel is, is turbulent or planar? Turbulent. Turbulent, right? You're probably pretty far out. Um, as you get closer to the surface though, say down by sand grain, you might be either into the no-slip zone or into laminar flow. <coughs> You know, this is important because it changes the way that fluids move, and it changes the way that organisms adapt to being in the moving water. So this flat flow boundary layer is a function of several things. If you have current again moving from your left to your right, then we have this substrate. We see this outer edge of the flow boundary layer. It's getting thicker and thicker as we move down, right? And it's shallow where you have a protuberance, and it's deeper where you have a pit. Okay, so this goes, remember I talked about throwing a javelin through the water or being streamlined with characteristic lengths and then how that affects viscosity? This is the exact same effect right here. That the, the wall is having less and less effect the longer it is that, that, that something's flowing past it. Okay, so if you're somebody who wants to be inside of a turbulent flow, let's say you are a black fly that has filtering apparatus and you're trying to force bacteria through that, you're gonna get yourself up right here, trying to get close to outside of that flow boundary and filter your food out as it goes by. If you're a lousy swimmer that crawls around between rocks, you're gonna to wanna to stay back here out of the higher water velocities and the back sides of rocks as opposed to the front sides where there's more, more effective flow. And I've already talked about the streamlining and I'm gonna talk about, with Reynolds, I'm gonna talk about a little more. It's intimately related to that flow boundary and turbulent flow. So at very small scales, very small, small Reynolds numbers, we have a situation where flow is laminar. And so it's slipping around the object as it moves through the water, or if the water's moving past it, it's slipping past it. But because you're at small scales, because viscosity is high, turbulence is very difficult to generate. And turbulence can cause flow vectors that pull against you, essentially. So, you, so if you're trying to move fast, you want to avoid turbulence. At this scale, it doesn't matter whether, there's, whether you're shaped so you create turbulence, because you can't create turbulence. As you get larger and larger, the Reynolds number comes up, the viscosity decreases, and the chance for turbulent flow increases. So then if you try to move a block shape through a fluid, you're gonna create these turbulent vortices back to essentially hold you back. In contrast, if we have a streamlined object, we'll, it'll take higher velocity to get that same turbulent flow going. So that's why you know sports cars are shaped like this. They want to go really fast, and the fastest ones, the fastest cars, have a very streamlined shape. They're trying to.